Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Luke Willer. I'm the chair of the physics department. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's impromptu lecture. Um, as you can probably infer, this lecture was partially inspired by the passing of Stephen Hawking, who, for many of us in science, he was a hero. Um, and um, he will certainly be missed. But, you know, we're ready. I see some of our graduate students here. Welcome. We are ready to take over the torch as needed. Uh, I hope you all got a chance to pick up one of these flyers. I want to put in a little plug for our observatory. We have public viewing every first Friday and third Tuesday of the month, um, 7 p.m. till late. We recommend that you check the website in case there are any changes. Uh, but in general, those are the uh, hours that we are uh, open for business. Okay. I can't promise you that you will see any black holes because they're kind of hard to see through the telescope. Uh, but uh, we'll try. We usually have we have an interesting uh, Mars phenomenon coming on, and there's a there's always something to do. Okay, and you get to peek through the telescope. You get to ask questions, and generally a good time is had by all. Okay, it's also my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Wolfgang Tichy, who is today's speaker. He's one of our resident experts in the physics department. And if you ever want to visit the physics department and meet some more of our experts, you're always more than welcome. Uh, Professor Tichy joined us in, well, he's not quite sure because he's a scientist and we are absent-minded. He thinks it was 2004, a lunar cycle or something. But anyway, the title of his talk is Black Holes, Dark But Illuminating. much for inviting me. So it's a pleasure to speak here. So as you've already heard, I'm going to talk about black holes and various issues related to them. And I'll also mention Hawking at some point, which is of course, uh, no, because he recently unfortunately died. It's not loud enough? Uh, well, I'm fast. So you have to follow me. Um, <laughs> okay. Another thing, uh, if somebody could give me a laser pointer, I just remember that might be good too. Uh, but for now, I'll go without. Um, so here's a plan of my talk, the things I want to talk about. So first I give a brief introduction to relativity because that's where black holes come from. And I will also say what black holes are. And then I mention some properties of black holes. Um, and then I will also switch and talk about gravitational waves because they have recently been observed. That's also interesting. I'll talk briefly about the detectors that we use to see them. Um, and uh, then I'll show, also say something about the first detection. Oh, it works. Where do I press? Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, and then at, at the end, I say something about research that's going on at FAU that's related to this, and then comes a summary. Okay. So here's the thing: the introduction to the quick introduction to relativity. Um, you probably all are familiar with space. Yeah? You live in three-dimensional space. Three-dimensional means that you you know there's left and right, there's backward and forward, and up and down. These are the three directions in space. And you know, in mathematics or physics, they're usually labeled by three coordinates, x, y, and z. Yeah? A value in x means maybe, maybe x is this way, left and right, and then a positive value in x of 10 means that you tend away from the origin, and a negative might be that you tend away from the origin in another direction, that kind of thing. Yeah? And once you have this kind of coordinates and this kind of way of measuring directions in space, and there are three of them, uh, you then can compute arbitrary distances between two points. And you have a point here, and here you can compute the distance between these two points by simply looking at the distances in each of the three coordinates, right? There's a thing that we call dx. That's the difference in two x coordinate values, maybe x2 minus x1. And similarly, you can compute a dy and a dz. And if you square all these three and add them together, you get the distance squared between two points. And this is how you can compute distances uh, in three-dimensional space. This space is also called Euclidean space. This is the space you're familiar with because you live in that space. Okay? Um, and this essentially looks like the Pythagorean theorem, but in three dimensions, that's why there are three terms instead of two. But when you do it in a plane, you have only two terms. Um, now, Einstein's interesting idea, or revolutionary idea, you could say, for special relativity was to consider that space is really, or space time, that is really a four dimensional thing. Basically, what he did, uh, he combined time and space together, called it space time, and then it's four dimensional. You have then four coordinates, t, x, y, z, where t is time. And x, y, z is just like before. Um, and then you can define distances in space-time. This is not no longer distances just in space, but in space-time, so the four-dimensional object. And the idea of the way you define this is essentially similar. You still have these three terms, 
dx squared and y squared and z squared. This is just like a distance in space. But he now, uh, there is now a, a term added that's dt squared. It's similar to these terms. It's also squared. The, the main difference is this one has a minus in front and also a coefficient. The coefficient is the maximum speed possible in, in that theory. And it happens to be the speed of light, which is really large. It's about 300,000 kilometers per second. This is not kilometers per hour, it's per second. Um, but nevertheless, it's finite. It's not infinite. Um, and so then this, this whole thing here then gives you distances in space time now. Um, and as you can see, because of this minus sign, uh, this can now be positive, negative, or zero. Right? This, these distances, they are always positive, or at most zero. If, you, if the two points you're considering are the same points, then it's zero. But this one can be both positive and negative. Um, and uh, this idea of this distance measurements basically divides space-time into regions. If you start, say, oh, I should first say what this picture is. So in this direction, there's space. And in this direction, there's time. And we're drawing only one space dimension, because drawing three in this picture and then time, it would be a bit hard to draw pretty much impossible. You could maybe imagine another axis coming out for the second space direction, coming out here, but you couldn't really draw uh, a third space axis, so that's why we're not even attempting it. And so now, in, in this, in this uh, diagram, you can now show places in space and in time, in principle at least. Um, and let's say we concentrate on this point here. This is a particular point in space, right, and a particular point in time. Um, and from this point, now you can measure distances to other points, like say, I don't know, a point over here maybe. And if that point over here is maybe at the same time, the same time coordinate, uh, then this dt here would be zero, and you get a positive answer, because these three things are probably not all zero also. And so out here you get a positive answer, while when you like, go straight up here maybe, here, then you would get a negative answer, because th this point and the point down there, they differ only by time, but not by the spatial location. Um, and so then you would get no, something light, uh, it's negative no, there. It's a, and this gives rise to this what we call light cone, uh, this cone basically divides space-time into two regions uh, when you consider this point. There is this point, that, 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 the region that's sort of outside the light cone, where, you, where the distances are space-like, that means they are positive. And there is also inside the light cone, where the distances are negative. And then there's the light cone itself. Along the light cone, the distances would be, would be zero. Uh, that's exactly when you, when you go from this point to this point. Uh, you know, in the picture, it doesn't look like zero, but when you compute it with this, there is a certain amount in time that you go and a certain amount in space, and they cancel out to zero. And that's what defines the light cone. And, and the interesting thing about this light cone is <coughs> um, that you, you can draw a light cone, of course, every point in space, time. And you can draw one here, you could also draw one over there, wherever you want. Uh, but the, the really interesting part is that um, since nothing can go faster than the speed of light, that's sort of what the theory says, um, you always have to, when you start here, you have to go inside the light cone. You cannot go from this point to, say, this point. It's impossible because it, to, to, to go that far to the right uh, and uh, that much in time, uh, you would have to move faster than light. Remember, light moves along this direction or this direction if it's going left or right. Uh, so if you want to go over here, you would have to move faster than light, and that's impossible. And therefore, that means that whenever you move in any way you want, you can move inside this light cone. Right? If you have a really fast spaceship, you can move maybe almost as fast as lights. You could move along this line or along that line, but you couldn't move out. Yeah? So this tells you something about uh, where you can go. That's why this light cone is useful. Okay? And the reason why there is a light cone and why there uh, why there's two regions, so to speak, is because of this uh, idea that you combine space and time, and then there's this minus sign in here. Okay, so this is about light cones. So now the next thing I want to this, and this is basically what I talked about, is uh, what's called special relativity. Yeah? Uh, later on, and special relativity deals uh, with classical physics, but doesn't include gravity. And later on, Einstein also wanted to include gravity into the picture, and he generalized this theory, and that therefore called it general relativity, and this is the one that includes now gravity. Yeah? And this theory says uh, that the presence of matter or energy, that's essentially equivalent, will curve space-time. The space-time I've just shown you, is this, like the one where I drew the light cone from the last slide. That one. Um, basically, every point is similar. You can draw such a light cone at every point. And every point looks pretty much the same as every other point. But uh, when you have now a matter or energy, it will deform space-time. And then the space-time will be curved and possibly different at every point. And the equation that governs this, how it's deformed, is this equation here. Well, here I've written it in words. It basically says curvature equals matter density. When I say curvature, I mean the curvature of space time. It's not deformed and bent, and so it's curved. And Einstein's equations essentially say that, that this is something that measures curvature. This measures something like matter, matter energy or something like this. 
And these two are equal up to some constant of proportionality. And the, the picture you can have in mind is that any massive or energetic object will curve space-time. And this is kind of a picture that, I've, that I show you here. Um, you can imagine, so, as I said, space-time is four-dimensional, so it's a bit hard to picture. But you can look at some sort of, or think about some two-dimensional analogon. You can think about like a flat rubber sheet. And then you put two stones on the sheet. And where you put the stones, there will be indentations. And in these indentations, so the rubber sheet at that place is then bent or deformed or curved. And that's what we're talking about. This is what happens in space-time. That space-time will be deformed or curved when you put massive objects or energy. And this is the picture when you have two massive objects placed here and here. And that, that's the kind of thing you would get. And in fact, this picture here is from a, a simulation I did a while ago uh, with two black holes, actually. This, so this would be, this comes from two black holes, and I even have, just to make it slightly more interesting, this should play a movie. Um, so this is the same thing, just bigger now. You, you see here two black holes, and they actually orbit, I mean, two, two places where it's curved, here and here, or more strongly curved, it's curved everywhere a little bit. Uh, and this is a simulation of two black holes that are actually in orbit, and what happens when I start the movie, they go like this, they go around each other, and actually they come close, and eventually will merge and form a single black hole. And you can see they merge now. Now it's curved in one place only. And then the movie starts again, and I'm going to play it again. It was just, but it, this just is was to illustrate to you that uh, you know this, this curvature is caused by any energetic or massive object, and also it can change in time because these objects can possibly move. Okay. Um, the other difference to special relativity that uh, to the theory I mentioned first. Uh, is that when you now compute distances in this curved space-time, the formula for it is very similar. There are still these squares of all these uh, coordinate distances, uh, but they have coefficients in front of them now. And these coefficients here, uh, they are no longer constant, at least in general. They depend on space and time. And this is what gives you this time-dependent, space-dependent curvature. And gravity is then considered really the curvature itself. Right? In, in, in Newtonian theory, gravity is considered a regular force, like any other forces. But in Einstein's theory, gravity is not really considered like another force. It's rather considered uh, to be the consequence of space-time deformation or, or curvature. So when you think about, um, you know, you, you know that the, the planets are going around the sun. You've all heard about this. Um, and they don't go along straight lines. And the reason for that is, according to Einstein's theory, is that every object wants to go along the uh, shortest path possible. Um, and in flat space time, the shortest path possible would be actually a straight line, and then objects move on a straight line. But if the, the space time is curved, then the shortest possible path is no longer a straight line. And this is why the planets move in um, something like circles and don't move straight. Okay? <clears throat> so this, this whole thing now, the first slide and the second one, this was a brief introduction to first special relativity and also general relativity. This is, of course, in very general terms, and uh, part of this probably you just have to believe. But these are essentially the basics about it. What I also wanted to say in the beginning, I forgot, is if you have any sort of questions, I don't mind if you interrupt me. If somebody asks a question, that's fine, I'll answer it. Okay? So, um, the next thing is that, okay, so now you have this, still a space time, it's just curved now, it's not so very different. You can still draw a light cone at every point, except at every point now you get a different light cone. The light cones can now be tilted because the space time is deformed. Okay? And this is, this is the next important thing I'm going to talk about, because this can give rise to black holes if there's enough tilting. So I'm switching now to tell you a little bit about black holes. <clears throat> so basically, black holes are regions <clears throat> where space-time is very strongly curved. And that it's curved so strongly that light cones are sort of all oriented inward. So here, what's happened over here on this picture on the right is a lot of light cones are drawn here. Right? There's a point here, and there's a little light cone drawn on it. And as you can see, these light cones are not all the same, they sort of tilt more and more to the right. And if you, for example, in this light cone, um, you can see you can move to the right and stay within the light cone, or you can move to the left and stay within the light cone, which means you can go both directions, uh, because you must stay the light cone, that's a law. Um, but these light cones tilt more and more, because the deformation is very strong, the coverage is very strong, and so if you have a light cone, say, here, then uh, you can certainly go to the right, but you can't really go to the left without leaving the light cone, which means that you, you sort of are forced to always go to the right. And that means that you can go only one direction. And this is essentially what a black hole is. A black hole is a region of space-time where curvature is so strong that all the light cones are tilted inward, which means that you can enter, but you cannot leave. So what a black hole is, is a region of space-time where you can enter, but not leave. It's like a one-way membrane you can go through, but you can't come back. Okay? And what's really shown here 
when I, when I talk about light constraint, time is again in the upward direction and space moving to the right, and it's again a picture where you basically show only one space direction or maybe two, and this is why there's a circle here, a black hole. Uh, when you draw in a three-dimensional space, it would be something like a sphere, like, maybe like that thing there. Um, but if you draw it in two dimensions, it would be something like a circle, and basically the boundary of that region into which you can enter but not leave anymore, that is what we call the black hole horizon. So a black hole has a horizon, and it's exactly this, this thing where you, you can go through without any real problems, uh, but you can never come back. That's what general relativity predicts and says. Yeah, and this is really what a black hole is then. Uh, now, black holes, for that reason, have a certain size. You can actually compute their radius, and the radius is directly proportional to their mass. You can see the bigger the mass, the bigger the radius. Uh, except they're extremely dense. They're the densest objects we know about. So if you had uh, a black hole that's the mass of the Earth, and the Earth is, the Earth is quite ma massive, as you know, um, if you use this formula to compute the radius, the radius would be just one centimeter. That means that would be the size of a black hole if you take the mass of the Earth, really small. If you take the mass of the Sun, it would be bigger. It would be a kilometer size. But remember, a kilometer is, is, is small. This is a point of very small. So that means if you, uh, even if you have a very massive black hole, it's still going to be small, and that's why we're talking about the fact that it's very dense. You can also say the other way around, if you take the Earth and compress it to this size, it would become a black hole. The same thing with the Sun, if you compress it to a kilometer-sized object, it would also become a black hole. Of course, this is, I mean, how can you compress Earth like this? You can't. But you need something very violent going on to do this. Um, I'll talk more about this later. Um, the other thing about black holes is, um, there are very strong tidal forces or tidal accelerations near the horizons. So when you come to this close to the black hole, this region where you can't get out anymore, even before you get inside, uh, these forces can be strong. They scale like one over mass square, which actually means that um, for if you put in a solar mass here, you get a force that's very, very strong. So if you approach a solar mass black hole and come close to it, uh, it will essentially rip you apart. But it will rip you apart in a particular way. It would, in one direction, the direction towards the black hole would pull very much. In the other two directions, it would push very much, so it may, would make you into very long spaghetti and destroy you that way. So it's very unhealthy to approach such a black hole. But uh, as it scales with the inverse of the mass square, uh, if you go to a much larger black hole, if you find one, uh, there it wouldn't be quite so bad if you approached the horizon. That there, near the horizon, the force would be weaker, and you could actually approach it and go nearby and look at it and not be really harmed. The other thing is, of course, if you go in, you would never come out again. And then, of course, you would go in further and further, and eventually this, this force would get stronger and destroy you as well. So better don't try it. Um, now, I already said to make a black hole is not so easy, right? Compressing the Earth or the Sun is it's not something you do just like that. Um, so the way they are formed usually, at least big black holes, they are believed to come from the collapse of massive stars. If a very massive star collapses somehow, then it can become dense enough that it might, may form a black hole at the core. And then once the black hole is there, as I said, things can go in but not come out, it can actually grow. So stuff can fall in and the black hole can get bigger. Um, and each time something falls in, it gets a bit bigger, and since nothing ever comes out, uh, it basically can only grow. The other thing is, the name black hole is really a good name because it's really black. Right? You can try to shine light on it, but the light will go in and nothing will be reflected because nothing can come out. So that means it's completely, totally black. It's not just like a, if you paint something black, it looks quite black. But it's much blacker than this. And, and that's why it's a good name. OK. So now, uh, there's more going on in black holes. Uh, and uh, this sort of, for the first time, this is where the name Hawking will be mentioned. Because the, the entire theory I was talking about so far, this is basically based on Einstein's theory. Um, so black holes have also singularities. And there were these uh, Penrose Hawking singularity theorems that were sort of proved in the 1970s. And the theorem says that inside a horizon, right, so once you have a black hole, you have this horizon through which you can go in but not out, that's one way of the thing. Uh, inside the horizon, a singularity will form. That's what the theorem says. You can prove that mathematically. And the only assumption you make to prove it is that uh, the theory obeys Einstein's equations, so general relativity, and that the matter that you have is a reasonable, as a physical matter. Um, and what it means, the term singularity, it means that uh, the space-time curvature, the thing I talked about, uh, this curvature, it goes to infinity at the singularity. Now, this means, of course, that everything will be crushed and nothing can survive an infinite force, because there's also infinite force then. But the other thing is that uh, at that point where it becomes a singularity, also Einstein's theory breaks down, because you get infinities in your calculations, and from these infinities, you cannot com with them you cannot compute anymore. You cannot compute what happens after this infinity, which means the theory actually breaks down at this point. But this happens inside the black hole. 
And the good part, or the positive news maybe, is you know, the theory doesn't break down completely because the outside of the black hole is unaffected of this and remains predictable. Uh, this has actually to do with that most nothing can come out of the black hole, so no signal of this singularity can, can be sent out and affect the outside. And by the, the surprising fact is that Einstein's theory actually predicts its own breakdown. It predicts that it will break down somewhere and it will break down in a, in a black hole. And it's up, presumably we need some other theory at the core of a black hole where the singularity forms to say what's going to happen there. This is why some people are looking for quantum gravity, which is supposed to resolve this. But it's, it's not found yet. There's no definite theory about this. Um, there's another thing that's interesting in that regard is the so-called cosmic censorship conjecture, which is unproven, but it's very likely that it's actually true. And that says that in nature, singularities only form inside horizons. Now, basically, it says, if of the singularity forms, it will have happened inside the horizon, and you won't be able to see it as long as you're outside. This is, this is the word censorship in here. Um, because if it wasn't inside the horizon, that would mean there is a region of space-time beyond which you cannot predict anything, and uh, that would be problematic, uh, to say the least. Yeah? So that's why people are sort of almost hoping that this cosmic censorship uh, conjecture actually holds. And in you know, the calculations they've done so far, it seems to hold, but there isn't really a proof. Okay. So now, there's a whole lot of theories about black, theorems about black holes. There's a few more. There's a so-called no-hair theorem. Um, it's a funny name for something. It basically just says that a stationary black hole is characterized by only three numbers. Its mass, its spin, and its charge. Nothing else. That completely describes the black hole, at least the outside. And hair would mean, the word hair, it would mean that there are more quantities needed to completely describe the black hole. Now, but really, what has been shown mathematically using Einstein's theory is that you need only three numbers. Which is actually, when you think about it, is actually quite amazing because if you think of any block of matter, it's made out of billions of atoms, presumably, or something like this. So you probably need billions of numbers to correctly describe something. This black hole, you know, it was made out of a star maybe initially, so it, con it, it contained all this information at some point. But at the end, you characterize it by only three numbers, which is very, very little. And this is why it's called no hair. The black hole has only this three. Maybe in some sense, you could say it has three hairs, but not much hair otherwise. <coughs> yeah, and. Uh, Another theorem is Hawking's area theorem, that's this Hawking proof, that the area of a black hole can only increase, uh, never decrease, again, assuming general relativity is valid. And this is basically the same thing as saying the black hole can only grow. Right? You throw stuff in it, its mass increases, and therefore the area. Yes? So this is where I had my, my first problem with black holes. They say that you characterize it by matter and charge. What is spinning? The black hole. I mean, It doesn't need to be physical. It's enough if the space-time curvature is spinning, and that's actually what's happening. So gravity, space-time curvature, and gravity is essentially the same thing. It, it can spin, and that's what's happening there. I mean, the spin. I mean, maybe you have a spinning star. So this is how the spin got there initially. It collapsed, and the spin stays there as a physical quantity. But what's in the end spinning is, the, is actually the space-time itself. There's even a thing called frame dragging. If you get close to a, a, a fast-spinning black hole, you get dragged with it. It's real. It's real. No. No, it doesn't require matter. Gravity alone is sufficient to do this. You can mathematically construct black holes out of nothing. You don't need matter to write to construct the matter. I mean, in nature, probably you need to collapse a star, but mathematically you construct them even without any matter, and you can still have that spin, still the same effect. On the outside, the black hole looks the same. Well. Probably most astrophysical black holes are not charged. And you would have, like, uh, if the black hole is neutral, you can throw in a bunch of charge and it will be charged. It's just like that. <coughs> and it then has uh, an electromagnetic field too. So that charge, like you throw in a bunch of charge, like you just said, that would be what is measured? Because if you throw it into the black hole, it goes to the electrolyzer. There should be nothing coming back out, including the force of the field. Well, this is, it's not that it's coming out, it's just. Uh, the, the black hole is then, uh, there is a, it's an electromagnetic field around the black hole, but it's not coming out of a black hole. And it's, it's, it, you could view it as being generated while the charge is still flying into the black hole, in some sense. So in the end, the black hole does have a charge, uh, in the sense that if you put any sort of electromagnetic object there, anything that's otherwise charged, it, it's attracted to the black hole as if it had a charge. That's how you would measure it. So it behaves just like a charged object. And that's why you can say it has charge. But it behaves the same, so why would you not? Okay. 
Um, okay, so, so this was about some theorems that are quite famous. Now, um, so I want to say something about also about quantum mechanics eventually. So first I have to talk about classical mechanics. So Einstein's theory is a classical theory, just like Newton's theory. It's different from Newton's theory. It's actually more precise and all that, and better, but it's still classical. And classical means um, the way we describe the theory, what kind of uh, basic concepts we use. Right? For example, it deals with particles and fields and points and space and time, that kind of thing. In principle, Newtonian theory does that too. Yeah? Um, and a particle, for example, would then be described by certain quantities, maybe it's mass, it's position, velocity, energy, linear momentum, angular momentum, all these quantities you can give about a particle. And these quantities that you can give and also measure, in physics they're often called observables, and they can in principle be measured with arbitrary precision. Right? I mean, if you have some bad measuring apparatus, maybe the number you get out is not very precise, but in principle you could build a better apparatus and measure it more precisely. Uh, that's how these theories work. And all of these can be measured uh, in principle with infinite precision if you only have good enough machines. Yeah? Uh, what I should also say about classical mechanics, classical mechanics is basically that they understand, um, humans are sort of born with some understanding about how the world around them works, I suppose. At least physicists are. Um, and uh, the intuition that we are born with is sort of like, like classical mechanics. And classical mechanics fits very well with the intuition we have. And so in that sense, classical mechanics makes a lot of sense. It's very good, uh, very easy to understand for humans. But there's also this other theory called quantum mechanics. It's different. Um, and in quantum mechanics, these observables I talked about, these things that you might want to measure, they still remain measurable. That's not different. The only thing is, or the main difference is that uh, some of them are not compatible with each other anymore. So what means that if you try to measure one very precisely, you can measure the other one at the same time with the same precision. So there's stuff like this happening. In particular, there's a so-called Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which I wrote down here. And it, okay, there is something, that, this is just a constant of nature, Planck's constant, and this product here has to be greater than that number. And what this here says is the delta P is the uncertainty in the momentum, for example, and the delta X is the uncertainty in the position. So this says, if you want, this product has to be always larger than some number. Uh, so if you want to make one of them very small, then the other one has to be bigger because otherwise the product wouldn't be larger than this number. Okay? Uh, and that implies that if you want to measure position very precisely, you cannot measure at the same time momentum very precisely. So this is a fundamental difference between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, you can both measure them with arbitrary precision in principle at least. In quantum mechanics, the ACA principle says you cannot ever do that, no matter what machine you build to measure it. Um, and uh, one reason for this is that really in uh, quantum mechanics everything is different. Like a, a particle is no longer like a little ball. But in classical mechanics you imagine a particle, you imagine it's like a little ball probably flying around or something like this. And, uh, this is a good classical intuition, but it's really not true according to quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics says that really there isn't a little ball. The whole thing is described by a thing called a wave function, which is an extended function of objects, I feel like a field. And that function essentially describes the entire system, um, but it describes it in the sense that it assigns only probabilities for certain measurements. Right? If you want to make a measurement, quantum mechanics tells you what's the probability that you get a certain outcome. It doesn't tell you more than this. Yeah? And in that sense, quantum mechanics is very different from our everyday intuition. I, I won't have time to talk much more about it, just to tell you it's extremely strange and weird. And actually, Einstein didn't like it very much, even though he was sort of one of the founders of at least the beginnings of quantum mechanics. Uh, but the thing is, with quantum mechanics, it has passed all experimental tests so far. And whenever classical mechanics and quantum mechanics disagree and give you different predictions, then you make a measurement, always quantum mechanics wins and is correct. So in that sense, one has to take this theory seriously. Um, the other thing about quantum mechanics, what it, what it fundamentally deals with the so-called wave function, uh, and that's that wave function itself, even though it assigns only probabilities, the wave function itself involves in a predictable way. There's an equation for it where you can say how, how it changes in time. Sorry? Uh, I'm a total layman. I don't know if this is a dumb question or not. But isn't it true that the quantum mechanics applies only to small subatomic particles and that our, the real world we sense does not comply with quantum mechanics principles? Um, I don't think anybody can say this with 100% certainty, but as far as we know, quantum mechanics applies to everything. So it applies also to macroscopic objects like yourself or this, this, this lecture hall or everything. It, it should apply to everything. The only thing is for large objects one can show that the, there is almost no difference between the predictions of quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. So you can as well use classical mechanics for it. The difference becomes more visible when the particles are smaller. 
but it, it should apply to everything. Okay, um, so now, so one of the most celebrated things that Hawking did, he's, he put quantum mechanics and black holes together. So this means a general relativity and quantum mechanics together. And as I said, general relativity or Einstein's theory is a classical theory. Um, and as I said already, in, in this classical theory, uh, black holes are surrounded by this horizon through stuff, through which stuff can enter but not leave. But then, uh, as I said, Haw uh, Hawking uh, added some quantum effects to that, and he showed that quantum effects lead to some kind of radiation coming from nearby the black holes. And this radiation made out of quantum particles can actually carry away energy from the black holes, which means that black holes by themselves, even though I told you earlier they're completely black, they are not completely black. He showed there is actually radiation that one should in principle see. So they're not totally black. So this, for this he got very famous, uh, and deservedly so. Uh, and what he also showed that this radiation has some sort of thermal character and is characterized by a temperature, which I've written down here, and it's like uh, 60 nanopair winds for a solar mass black hole, and it scales with the inverse of the mass, so the more massive for smaller the temperature, which means that this temperature is going to be very low for macroscopic black holes, so the kind of black holes that we have observed. It's actually so low, it's so incredibly low, we, nothing else has this temperature, that low temperature, which means they radiate extremely little, which means, in fact, we will never observe this with whatever instruments we have. At least we can't think of an instrument where we could ever observe Hawking radiation. It should exist, but we, shouldn't, we, we don't have much hope to observe it. And the reason why it was never measured is probably why Hawking never got a Nobel Prize. Right? They, they give prizes for things that are actually measured. Um, but the thing is, nevertheless, these black holes should radiate. Um, and as I've said, the smaller the black hole, the more it radiates. And since this thing radiates, it's losing energy and therefore mass. It means actually the black hole over time is shrinking. If nothing is falling into it, if it's totally isolated, then it would slowly shrink over time. But when I say slowly, I mean really slowly, because it's radiating so little. The, the, the time it takes for uh, a solar mass black hole to evaporate is written here. And this T universe means the, the age of the universe, which is 14 billion years. But it doesn't take that long. It takes way longer than this. It takes 10 to 53 times longer than the age of the universe for this black hole to evaporate. It's basically forever. Uh, it's very long. 10 to 53 is a 1 and then 53 zeros. That number times the age of the universe. So it's huge. Yeah? Um, and that's why it also radiates very little. You can imagine that now. Huh? So, but in the end, a black hole, at some point, it should radiate more and more and it will evaporate. It will disappear. Which means um, yeah, we have this region where nothing can come out. And eventually, it should disappear. And this is what Hawking showed. Um, and since uh, I'm talking a bit about Hawking, the next thing that came out of this was the so-called information loss paradox, which is actually still not really resolved. Um, and as I said, black holes emit Hawking radiation. Hawking showed this. Um, but on the other hand, there's this Nohair theorem that says they're characterized really by three numbers. Um, and then when you use general relativity, uh, computers Hawking radiation, the Hawking radiation should depend on these three numbers. So it's essentially independent of whatever material made the black hole in the first place. Right? Uh, you, you collapse a star or something, made a black hole, but then it's characterized by three numbers, and these three numbers, then uh, you know, th that's what sort of informs the Hawking radiation. So the Hawking radiation doesn't have very much information. This is what's called the information loss paradox. Basically, a star made out of trillions and trillions of atoms or whatever uh, had a lot of information, but then in the end there's only this black hole and the Hawking radiation. The Hawking radiation has practically no information. And so where did all the information go? That's the question, that's the paradox. Okay? And the, the paradox is, you could say, okay, maybe it's just lost, and that could be. Uh, but the thing is, the, the quantum physics says, if it's correct, that the quantum evolution of any system is predictable. That means it never loses information. So the information should be somewhere according to quantum mechanics. But of course, quantum mechanics could be wrong. And at first, Hawking believed this. He thought information is lost, and, and somehow quantum theory is incomplete. It doesn't capture this. But later, actually, he changed his mind. Um, and this was fairly recently, in 2016, they published a paper about this. And they called it soft hair and black holes. They basically um, demonstrated that it might be possible that the black hole horizon in quantum mechanics can be excited. So whatever part of the falls in the black hole and passes it, the horizon, uh, then it causes an excitation on the horizon that will stay there and store the information. So that when the black hole later evaporates, that information can be retrieved and nothing is lost in that sense. But this is just, uh, it's not a full-fledged full calculation. It's not a full-fledged proof. It's just basically starting something. Uh, and he did this fairly recently. And it's, it's not entirely settled yet, this kind of thing. But 
basically the reason why I'm mentioning this is that to just show you there are all these theorems about black holes and you can put two theories together and see what it says. So basically, they're sort of like, the black holes are like theoretical playgrounds where you can develop theories and see what they say and does it make sense what the theory is telling you, that kind of thing. So it's, it's a very useful testing route for things. Now, but, so, and now I'm basically switching gears and talking about something else because all this is theoretical, but as I said, the Hawking radiation will not be measured in, in our lifetimes and probably not even much longer. Huh? Um, but black holes have actually been observed. So I'm now switching to astrophysical black holes where you can actually see something, but not Hawking radiation. Okay, so uh, conventional astronomy has observed black holes for a while now. Conventional means that, you know, when you look at electromagnetic radiation, like light or radio waves or whatever, or x-rays, uh, and, and one of the way, and now you can wonder, so how do I see a black hole? It's supposed to be black and I can't see the Hawking radiation. Well, the, the way you see it is if something else happens around it. Here's a picture uh, of a star, this is with a star, orbiting a black hole, which is black here. Uh, and the star is just orbiting in some orbit, and uh, since it's relatively close, some of the mass of the star, some of the matter is uh, basically sucked off the star and is falling into the black hole. And while it's falling into the black hole, it's being compressed and accelerated very much, and this material gets very fast and very hot. And when it's, when, when it's like that, it's, it starts getting hot and it radiates as well. This is not hot and radiation, it's just ordinary radiation, and the material gets hot. Uh, and that can emit x-rays. And one of the first things that people observed when they saw it's a black hole, is it was an x-ray source, Cygnus X1. And so basically what you're seeing is not the black hole itself, you see its influence on other matter. That before the matter falls into the black hole, it can radiate. Once it's in the black hole, you won't see it anymore, but before it's there, you can see it. Yeah? And so this is the kind of thing that you, that, that's why we know black holes are there. This would be something like a solar mass black hole. There are actually different sizes of black holes, so there are, this is, there's lots of black holes that are maybe several solar masses in size, like they, they're probably made, made from stars. There are probably also intermediate mass black holes. There could be hundreds or thousands of solar, mass, solar masses, although we don't know so much about them yet. But then there are also supermassive black holes. It's another category. And they are million to a billion times of the solar mass. So they have as much mass as a billion stars, maybe. And they are actually very common. They are at the centers of most galaxies. Um, and uh, when you have such a thing at the center of a galaxy, stuff can fall in, like giant gas clouds or lots of stars. So when this happens, the same effect that the, the material gets very hot when it comes close to the black hole and radiates. And this is what powers quasars or active galactic nuclei. They can be very bright. Uh, so the, the energy source for them is a supermassive black hole in the center. And we have one too in other galaxy. There's a supermassive black hole, except it's quiet at the moment because nothing is falling in. We know about it because there's some stars orbiting around it, but they are far enough away that they're not falling in. And you can just uh, observe the orbits and you see nothing in the middle. And therefore, it must be a black hole. Now, so these things have been observed with electromagnetic radiation. Um, okay, and the, the next thing I want to talk about now is what's called gravitational waves that has only recently been observed. So I told you already, if you have uh, two objects orbiting each other, like two black holes or two stars or whatever, they create this deformation in space-time, this curvature, and that's time-dependent. So they can create ripples in space-time. They actually will, whenever they orbit, they'll do that. If I, if I even do this with my hands, I'm making gravitational waves as well, these ripples. They're just too weak to measure. In order to make strong ripples, you need some sort of strong effect. And what you need to do to make strong enough gravitational waves that you have any hope of measuring them is you need to maybe have two orbiting stars in very, very close orbits, or two orbiting black holes, or an exploding star, or something like this. This could make something that's strong enough. But basically, when people talk about gravitational waves, they mean ripples in space-time itself. Right? Spa the fabric of space-time is deformed in a time-dependent way, and these ripples can propagate through space-time. They propagate at the speed of light. And they are there and can in principle be measured. Um, and what happens when you have two uh, things going around each other like this, so they, they circle around each other and then they emit these gravitational waves, it means the system loses energy and that means the orbit tightens, these things come closer and closer until they finally merge. And the kind of waveform, the wave you measure, then looks sort of like this, this is a so-called chirp waveform for two solar mass size objects. Um, and what you can see, both the frequency and the amplitude is increasing in this chirp. And the reason for that is, when these two things, they orbit, when they come closer, they move faster, and therefore the frequency increases. And also, because they move faster, the, the amplitude of the wave increases. So you can see that too. And that's what's called a chirp. And this here, what I have there is a chirp, for, as I said, for, for two objects that have both of them about two solar masses. And this frequency is actually in the audible regime. In principle, humans should hear this. The only thing is, of course, the amplitude is way too small. We will never hear this. But you can, when you have such a signal, you can essentially crank up the amplitude, and then it will be audible. 
and, and I brought you some very short sound sample of how this would sound. So, sh 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 I'm going to start this now. So, you can see the frequency goes up and the amplitude gets louder, you know, and then it ends at some point. And this is this is the kind of uh, signal that people are interested in when they talk about gravitational waves, at least one of the signals. Um, and so people have built big machines, big detectors to measure them. And two years ago, for the first time, they measured something. And these, these machines are basically giant interferometers. Here are two pictures. One of them is in Louisiana, and one in Washington, like Livingston and Hanford. They are the two cities or towns. And uh, these interferometers, they have four kilometer long arms. So these are big machines. They have two arms, one here, one here. This is an aerial photographs. Uh, and these guys have been able to measure these gravitational waves for the first time. And what they measure is essentially when this wave goes through, as I said, this is a deformation in space-time. What happens is that space-time itself contracts or expands, and so the distance in, in this pipe they have here increases or decreases by a small amount, and this is what they measure with lasers, how long is the distance. So basically, do distance measurements to get at the gravitational waves, and they have been able to do this. Um, and the kind of source they measured first was the merge of two black holes. Here's a cartoon of this. You have these two black holes. They go around each other. They may have some spin. They go more or less in circular orbits. But they emit gravitational waves, which I've drawn here in red. And eventually they come closer and closer. They merge and become a single black hole that may move off at some speed and still has a spin. And while they do that, they emit these gravitational waves. And these waves carry away energy. And these can be measured. Um, and this actually happened fairly recently, in 2015, the first time it was measured. Uh, so these are the data from the two detectors in North America, in Livingston and Hanford. And as you can see, the curves look a little bit jagged. This is because of noise. There's also noise in the detector. Anything that changes the distance between two mirrors in your laser system can cause noise. And that could be seismic noise, thermal noise, cars driving by, I guess, in Louisiana, people shooting at the instrument, that kind of thing. So, um, and that's why you have noise. But what you can also see that, apart from the noise, these signals are similar. And you can actually even superpose these signals. And then you see there's a small difference between them. Uh, and that's because these two instruments are in two different states. And in one state, the gravitational waves arrive first, and then in the, a little bit later in the other one. The reason is they travel at the speed of light, so they're not infinitely fast. And if you account for this time of arrival distance, difference, sorry, then these curves agree with the errors completely. And they also agree with theoretical prediction. Right? This thin curve here, I don't know how well you can see it, is the prediction from general relativity, what you should see. And basically, this, everything agrees very well with general relativity. It's what they measured. And just in 2017, Weiss, Parrish, and Thorne got a Nobel Prize for this, because they were sort of the initial, they, they started doing this experiment, a LIGO experiment or measuring device that they built this. And it's the very first test of general relativity in a strong field regime. Right? General relativity has been tested in various regimes, but usually gravity was weak. Here, the gravity when the two black holes collide is really strong, and the waves come from that region, and therefore it's a, it's a test of strong gravity. Um, uh, yeah? Uh, about uh, the, the, the sampling that you made, I'm always at the house about it, because we're not supposed to be able to hear gravity because it's traveling through the space time curvature set. So, why, how are we getting the target? Well, it's basically this, this is the gravitational wave. The, 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 the wave is basically causing distance changes, so oscillations in distance. And this has an amplitude, and from, for these two black holes, the amplitude is so low you would never hear it. Basically, the amplitude has just been amplified. Just the amplitude is higher now, that's all. Otherwise, it's the same. Well, I don't exactly know how. So if you had a gravitational wave that was extremely gigantic, I mean, much bigger than what they've observed. Right? This is a large event, although it happened far away. Uh, if, you had, if you were maybe next to this, maybe the gravity wave would be strong enough to actually push you here. You probably could also feel it in yourself. Right? You probably would feel it in your whole body. Right? Yeah. It's moving space, time, and everything in it, with it. But the frequency range is audible. That was the point about this, at least for this mass range. Right? And I should have said this, this, this event happened uh, 1.3 billion light years ago, and therefore 1.3 light billion light years away, so really far away. And it could still be seen. Um, and the reason why it could be seen is that so what they could infer is that it was a 29 and a 36 solar mass black hole, the two parts before they merged. And in the end, the final black hole that came out of it was 62 solar masses. So if you add up these two numbers, it doesn't come out of 62. Three solar masses are missing. 
And the way they went is in gravitational waves. They were converted into gravitational wave energy. And if you think about it, three suns were converted into gravitational wave energy, that's a lot. It's actually not mean a lot because the output at the peak was 50 times more than all the stars in the universe combined. But not in visible light like the stars, but in gravitational waves. It emitted only gravitational waves, nothing else. But it's a huge energy output. Yeah? And uh, one of the first things you learn from this is that black holes in these mass ranges actually exist around 30 solar masses. We didn't really know that for sure before. Nobody had seen them before, but now we know they're there. Um, I mean, one could also, with two detectors, you get a crude estimate of where it happens somewhere in the southern hemisphere, but not much more, we could say. And the other thing is what people could see is that we got good agreement with general relativity, um, and that uh, the mass and the spin of the final merged black hole that you get out of it, you can measure that too, that is expected from the mass and spins that you get from the initial black holes. And also the uh, change of the frequency versus time, this chirp I told you, this kind of signal, the, the signal that you predict uh, uh, actually agrees with what was measured. Okay, so this was a very interesting event and led to a Nobel Prize uh, in, in 2017. Uh, and now there was another event in the meantime, uh, just last year, uh, that's slightly different. I want to say a few things about that too. Um, and uh, <coughs> this was uh, not two black holes, but two neutron stars instead. Uh, so this uh, is different in a sense. The only, I mean, I should say in the end of this, there was probably a black hole, and that's why it fits in this talk, and that's why I'm mentioning it. It's also gravitational waves. So it's, it's similar. You have two, two neutron stars going around each other, and eventually they merge. And they make gravitational waves just the same. And again, this was observed in these two detectors in North America. And, uh, and you can see the signal here. What's shown here is frequency versus time. You get some sort of excess frequency in this here. You can see the signal here, probably. And this detector is, very, is less visible, and in this one you don't really see it, unless you enhance it somehow. This detector is in Italy. It's a little bit smaller, a little bit less sensitive. That's why it's harder to see it here. But they had it immediately in three detectors this time. And they could, again, measure the masses to some degree, to some accuracy of the two neutron stars before they merged. They could also figure out the total mass and how much was radiated. And again, a large amount was radiated, except this system in, altogether was less radiation, but it was also closer. The, last, uh, the first black hole event was 1.3 billion light years away. This was just, uh, I don't know, somewhere between 80 and 160 million light years away. And the interesting thing about this is that it didn't just produce gravitational waves. 1.7 seconds later, there was a gamma ray burst. Uh, and that is because when these two neutron stars collide, a lot of matter is ejected. So you have a lot of nuclear matter swirling around that system, and that starts to glow and to shine. And the first thing you found was gamma rays, and later they observed X-rays, ultraviolet rays, optical light, infrared light, and radio waves, all of that coming from that source. And that, of course, you can only get from that source, because if the whole thing is black holes, the black holes wouldn't radiate anything besides gravitational waves. So here you get much more. Uh, and from this, you can then I mean, from these measurements, you can put at least some constraints on the equation of state of nuclear matter in, in that sense, because uh, on neutron star matter, neutron star matter is so dense that we don't really know what equation of state it obeys, and so we can get some constraints from astrophysics about this kind of thing. It's interesting. Sorry, uh, which one is the same? Well, it's not really this one. It would be the same. It should look like this. So, did you get it? Did you get it? No, it did. It's just this is basically the raw output. And they can use something like called matched filtering to sort of see if there's a signal or not. And this is not done here. Yeah? It's not visible to the naked eye, yes? In terms of time, how long were they able to observe this? So this here, uh, I think you can see it on here. It's about 30 seconds, a signal. And then after 30 seconds, they quickly had to send out a message to the astronomers to look for gamma ray bursts in that direction because they had a rough direction of where it came from because of three detectors. And as I said, 1.7 seconds later, something was seen. So this is fast. Uh, I also wanted to mention that there is uh, some research going on related to general activity at FAU. We have the Faust group, the Florida Atlantic University Space Time group, and there's a bunch of members in there, like you know, the in alphabetic order. Uh, Chris Beadle, for example, works on classical and quantum gravity. There's also Johnson Engel. He works on quantum gravity, quantum cosmology, black holes, uh, and stuff related to quantum gravity, but also a bit on classical relativity. There's also Mushin Han, who works on, on loop quantum gravity, classical gravity, quantum geometry. This, he works on all stuff, also on holographic quantum entanglement, <coughs> gauge theory, and quantum field theory. We also have Warren Miller, who works also on general relativity, black hole astrophysics, Reggie calculus, and sometimes also quantum gravity. 
and also myself. So I, I work on general relativity, specifically on American relativity, to simulate these things, uh, and also on black holes, neutron stars, and gravitational waves. So there's a bunch of people here. Um, and I wanted to show, so I'm involved in simulations of, for example, these neutron stars. I wanted to show you a movie that was made by one of my collaborators with our code from, uh, from these neutron star events. So as I said, there were these two neutron stars. It was observed. Uh, and then we did a simulation about this with masses that are consistent with what was observed. And this is the movie I'm going to show you now. Let me just start the movie first before I say more. <coughs> so what you see here, uh, so in the, <coughs> it's a, I guess you can see, in the middle are the two stars. We'll zoom in later. And I just stopped it now. And uh, so the stars are in blue. The two stars are in each other. And in yellow, we'll see the emitted gravitational waves. And the signal will be also shown here in yellow. So that's this yellow thing coming in a moment. So the movie. And there will be also zoom in onto the stars. So the stars are being zoomed in here now, as you can see them better. And in yellow, the gravitational waves emitted, and down there, the signal. <clears throat> and you can see these stars orbit, and they get closer and closer, because they lose energy due to gravitational wave emission. That's the same as for black holes. Yeah. And then they crash into each other and start emitting a lot of ma material. And so there's a lot of nuclear material, and neutral material now around this thing. So it's a, you get this torus of material swirling around some dense central object. And eventually, this object will actually collapse into a black hole. See that in a moment. Uh, it's getting, uh, you can't see it now, but it's getting denser and denser, and eventually a black hole forms. And once I stop the movie, what you see here now is this, this torus of material swirling around the black hole. The black hole is huge. What's shown is the horizon of the black hole in black. Yeah? <clears throat> and then uh, you know, stuff falls in the black hole, and so around the black hole is then a region where you don't see very much. Yeah, and this is in collaboration with various institutions in Germany and Italy, so now I guess the movie um, repeats again. Um, but so the reason, how, the reason why I talk about it is, again, it results into a black hole surrounded by a massive torus, and this massive torus emits all kinds of electromagnetic radiation. So maybe that I started again. I'll leave it be. So you can see that's how this torus forms there. And uh, I guess when we have the black hole, I'll stop it. And so you can see when the black hole forms, there's still a lot of material near the black hole, but then sort of everything falls in nearby the black hole and there's some sort of little gap where there's nothing around the black hole. Okay, so now I stop it here. <coughs> um, and uh, so this, you then get basically lots of neutrons out there, very dense material, and they undergo nuclear reactions, these neutrons, and form all kinds of you know, other nuclei. And that, that's what powers the electromagnetic radiation. There's nuclear reactions going on that cause a lot of electromagnetic radiation. That's why there was a gamma ray burst and all these other observations. That's called a, a kilonova event. It's, it's relatively bright. And the interesting sort of little piece of information I wanted to mention about this is that um, most of the heavy elements in the universe are believed to create an event like this. Right? If you think about gold and platinum and things like this, they are, uh, most of them are, have been created like this. So if you have a gold ring or something like this, it came from an event like that, very likely. Two neutron stars smashed into each other, some material got ejected, and it formed, it had nuclear reactions going on that made gold and platinum and these kind of things. And later that material got swept up maybe by some, some cloud and ended up in a planet eventually, so here, and then we found it. Yeah? So that's actually interesting to think about that uh, such metals come from that. I should maybe also say that we are ourselves are also made of star stuff, but we don't come from this. We come probably from a supernova explosion where a star exploded, and there was nuclear reactions going on too, and they made the lighter elements like carbon or oxygen, the things we are made of, they, that, that came from stars. Yeah? So it's interesting to think about. Okay, so now I guess I'm done, I'm also out of time. So to summarize, <coughs> uh, general relativity predicts black holes and gravitational waves, and it has been observed by now. And the first part of the talk, when I was talking about some of the things that Hawking did, for example, uh, you, you maybe could see that black holes can serve as some sort of informative test bed for theories. When you can combine various theories and see what the black hole, what the black hole case says about it. And you, at least it is stimulating uh, to see what comes out of this. And sometimes, you know, when something doesn't make sense, you have to think further and see what, how can you fix that theory, or what, what, what else might be wrong. Uh, but the, the, so from the observational side, there's something else. The gravitational waves have now actually been observed directly, first for two black holes. And this, I showed you one measurement, but there were a few more in the meantime. And also, it was recently observed for two neutron stars. And so far, all the observations that we have made agree with general relativity. And what one can say about these gravitational waves is that 
In some sense, there is now a new era of gravitational wave astronomy, right? I mean, people built all this, all kinds of instruments. First, maybe a telescope, uh, then radio telescopes, and all kinds of other things. And always, when you when you basically build a new instrument, you see something new and unexpected, and that will happen here probably at some point as well. So, gravitational waves are not electromagnetic waves; they're just something completely different. And now we can see them, and so maybe there are sources that we'll see that we have not seen before. Yeah, and together with numerical simulations, they should give us a better understanding of the universe altogether. I mean, also these theoretical considerations together, all of this helps us understand how things actually work. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>